Good afternoon, Canucks fans. There we go. And welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation. Been a while since we've been in studio, so sorry for the rust there. Uh, but it is Canucks Conversation. It is David Grelli. It is Harmon Dial. And it is Grady Sass, the man at the controls, hitting switches, producing for us. We are back at the Wall Center, folks. And you can be at the Wall Center, too, for your next meeting space and event. Contact the Wall Center for all your event needs at sales at Wall Center. Dot com. And as always, Canucks Conversation is brought to you by the 2023 Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech, but it still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain, whether it's rain, snow, mud, or your friend's questionable post-game recaps. The BZ4X will get you through it all. Oh, it's been a while, Harm. We're back. We're back in studio. Done a lot of remote shows lately. Yeah, especially it was funny off uh, off the top. As you first spoke into the mic, both our laptops started echoing. And yeah. no, normally it's just one of us maybe in those uh, in in that situation we were both spamming our uh our volume button on our laptop to quickly shut it off. So that's how you know it's been a while. It has been a while, but we're happy to be back. We're very happy to be back and uh I hinted at it yesterday, folks. I'll just tell you what we were going to do because we'll do it on a future show. I don't think we're going to have time to do it today. We'll do it on a future show, though. We were going to blind rank Canucks all time. And for those that don't know what that is, I'll explain it very surface level right now because we're not going to do it on today's show. So I'll explain it more in depth when we actually do it. But basically, uh, we've got our producer going to throw up five Canucks and we're going to blind rank them. I don't know. Should we do... Yeah, I guess we have to do it together. But yeah, blind rank the Canucks uh, all time. So basically, you have a list one to five. You see a Canuck, you have to put them on the list, but you don't know who the next person's going to be. So you see them one by one, the names. Exactly. So if you see Trevor Linden, number one, and you say, okay, I want to put Trevor Linden at number one, but then Pavel Burry is the next pick, you have to put Pavel Burry at number two. You can't bump him down. You have to... Anyways. And, and the purpose is to get a list that as closely matches reality as possible. Yeah, and see if you can do it and, like, pull it off. Anyways, it's cool. Uh, Okay, do people have audio? People are saying they don't have... Yeah. My my phone... (laughs) Speaking of laptops, my phone was on with the live stream, and I had audio. I could just hear it for a second there. I had audio, so... No, we're good. We're good. We're fine. Giving me a heart attack over here, people. (laughs) Okay, uh, let's talk about last night's game. This segment, our game recap segment, is brought to you by the Four Winds Featherweight IPA. If you're looking for a nice hoppy beer but still want something light, then look no further than the Four Winds Featherweight IPA. At just 4.5%, this incredibly light packed light IPA is packed full of tropical and citrusy goodness. Available now at liquor stores across BC or through the Four Winds online shop for home delivery anywhere in BC at fourwindsbrewing.ca. Very flavorful at just 4.5%. Look at that can. Uh, go to Delta. River Road in Delta. Locally owned and operated. That is fourwindsbrewing.ca. Okay, Harm. Last night's game. This is the reason we're not going to do the blind ranking segment because we have a lot to talk about after last night's game. Namely, the power play. We're going to dedicate a whole segment to the power play. Feels like that's the story of last night's game, but I'm going to challenge you to talk about last night's game without bringing up the power play. I think it continues a trend where we know at this point that the Canucks can hang against some of these top Western Conference teams. It's not as if they get completely outplayed, completely outclassed. But we are seeing a trend now, especially in the second half, where it's been difficult to turn these, as Rick Tockett would call them, coin flip games into actual wins. Uh, You think back to all three Colorado games, for example. Mm -hmm. The Canucks were competitive in every single one of those, but just couldn't find a way to actually pull through with the victory uh, in them. Uh, the most recent LA game is a good example of that. Uh, now Dallas. Uh, and that also extends to the last time they played Dallas in um, in late December as well. And I'm really trying not to tie back into the power play, but ultimately, as we get into these lower scoring games, that's what has to be a difference maker for you because I think we can see now whether you want to call it a combination of Elias Lindholm, his injury, and the Canucks not getting the top six difference maker they thought they were going to be when they went out and acquired him, Uh, having to shuttle Hoaglander up into the lineup where early in the season, he was such a monster offensive driver on the fourth line. So now you're not getting as much secondary scoring from that bottom six. 
Uh, the blue line has dried up in scoring, mm-hmm. right? Quinn Hughes was scoring a ton in the first half. Don't I know it? Philip Peronik, Car- even guys like Carson Susie and Tyler Myers are chipping in, chipping in with offense. That's dried up. So it's been harder and harder to manufacture goals. You're not getting as many bounces as you were in the first half. And, um, and really the story of this Canucks team now is that they're a defensive juggernaut, right? One of the silver linings from this game has to be that they limited a potent Dallas offensive attack to zero even strength goals, which is enormously impressive. But they aren't going to be able to come through and and go deep into playoffs until that power play gets sorted. The power play is the thing that I brought up last week when the Canucks were scuffling, and I said, this is the only thing I'm concerned about, and it continues to be that. Um, That's the next segment, though. I'm going to give you a positive that I thought of watching this game. You brought it up, no even strength goals. Something that this Canucks team, this core that we've watched for years now, has made a habit of doing is when that offense dries up, when the offense isn't working, they start cheating. They start giving up rush chances against. They start giving up prime looks against their goaltender, backdoor tap-ins. They've limited that tremendously this season. And again, their staples, they're protecting the guts of the ice. They've done that all season long. They've had a few hiccups here and there. But again, that's what I attribute last week when I was talking about okay, yeah, I'm not too worried about the 5-on-5 five five play. The thing I'm worried about is the power play. That's kind of what I was talking about was that's a positive for this team is that when the offense isn't there, they don't start cheating. They don't start looking for offense. They don't start um, coming out of their defensive structure in order to find that offense. Like, that's a mark of a playoff team, a good playoff team. That's what good playoff teams do is they trust what they have and they stick with it. So I like that the Canucks have stuck with it. Again, like you said, zero even strength goals last night. That's a really, really, that, that's, that's a positive for this team. And again, the power play is the big negative, and ultimately I think it's what cost them last night's game. Positive all around on the rest of the game, I'd say. Yeah, especially watching how much havoc Dallas consistently creates around the crease. And I know there were some goal mouth scrambles, but they do that against every team. The important thing is the Canucks were able to pretty consistently box out and make sure sure that they won those battles and ensured that stars forwards didn't have an opportunity to, to get clean rebound chances right on the doorstep. I mean, there was even one play where Philip Ronick, a guy that has been below average defensively in the second half of the season, Mason Marchman, a big, strong body in front of the net, had an opportunity, was going to get a great, a glorious chance in front, and Hironic bowled him over and prevented him from being able yeah. to get a scoring chance. And, and that's the type of commitment you're going to need. Defensively, I have so much trust in this team, and I made this joke on Rinkwide yesterday. Who could have imagined that a year ago, or more specifically, 14 months maybe, when Bruce Boudreau sure. was fired, yeah, yeah. that we'd be talking about a Canucks team that is elite defensively, were pretty confident in their penalty kill, which previously was 32nd in the NHL last season, and their problem is problem recently has been scoring goals and the power play. It's crazy to think about. Does it all remind, and again, I don't think it's fair to say this per se, but does it all remind you of what the Canucks were like right before Travis Green got fired? Because they locked it down. They tried to play super defensively, but they just didn't have the firepower to outscore playing a strong defensive system. A little bit, but I feel like this team has still executed it way better. And yeah. the, the other big difference is the penalty kill was lousy. Right yes, before that's Green a good point. got uh, let go. And so if you're solid at five on five, but you're still leaking on the PK, that's never going to work. Plus, the Canucks since Jan 1 have been elite defensively in terms of their metrics. We're talking top three in the NHL hmm. across the board when you look at uh, shots against, when you look at uh, expected goals against. Even when Travis Green started to get this team to play better defensively at the start of that 2021-22 season, it was they were more middle of the pack defensively. They weren't yeah, anywhere point. close to where they, where they are today. So I don't think that's really comparable. But one of the trade-offs of, of being so committed defensively is you're not going to be a team that creates off the rush, right? And I think that's by design. I think that's okay. But one of the weaknesses of that, one of the trade-offs is that you're going to have lulls if you can't create offense in other ways. And right now it's been difficult to produce on the man advantage. It's going to be the topic of our next segment. And I, 
I think we should just get like. Do you have anything else you want to say about last night's game? I was I thought it was a good game for Casey DeSmith. I told you, like I, I thought he would come out and have a strong game and get back to his staples, and I think he did that. Like I thought Casey DeSmith was good last night. Yeah, I thought he was solid. I also liked Dakota Joshua's return. Uh, oh six yeah, hits. yeah. We just talked about that. He had some good energy. Honestly, for first game back, his skating looked good. Uh, he he didn't look gassed. Like sometimes you can tell when players returning from injury they get caught out for a shift for a little bit too long. Yeah. And you can see them doubled over going to the bench. There yeah. was nothing like that for Joshua, which I think is a really encouraging sign. He was out on the ice for that six on five situation, which I thought was well-deserved as, as a bigger body. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I thought it was a successful return for him and the other connect that deserves a shout out by far their best player. I think outside of maybe DeSmith, And even then I still think Garland was better than DeSmith. Sure. Garland. Really, the filthy play to set up Miller on on that goal, taking that cross check from Haskinen, which was a bit of a borderline hit, but to that, but to then stay on his feet, make that spinning pass, the spins, man. And it wasn't just that play; he was consistently creating yeah. all night. In the first period, he set up Pedersen for a high danger chance, uh, right um, right on the doorstep where Ottinger denied uh, Pedersen. He had some uh, a couple of other looks throughout the game as well. I thought Garland was by far their best player. Oh, I think you're absolutely correct. And I, again, as somebody who really liked the Smith's game last night, I would put Garland over to Smith. If we're picking Canucks stars, Garland first star, to Smith second star. Who's your third star? There wasn't really a standout. I guess you could say JT because he scored, but outside of scoring, Fair enough. Uh, there wasn't a lot for him. But I also think, by the way, at five on five, it would have been nice to see a little bit more from Pedersen in his line, especially yeah. because he had Brock on his right wing, right? Which I was a little bit surprised by because JT and Besser have been... Stapled together. Stapled together. They've been so effective. And Besser, we've talked about this before, he's not the type of player that's going to create chances on his own. He's going to be the trigger man in the slot. He needs an elite playmaker to set him up. JT Miller is his team's best playmaker right now. And from that perspective, Miller was thrown to the Wolves. Right, he had Baines on his line, a recent AHL call up, and Sam Lafferty. So he's got like we've spoken at length about Pedersen having less than ideal wingers. This is about as rough as it gets for a top six centerman. And Miller still spent mo most of his shifts against that dominant Rope Hints line. Um, so he absolutely, even if he hadn't scored, still would have gotten a pass for, for last night. But again, from Pedersen, you would have, you know, with Hoaglander and Besser, that's arguably your two best wingers yes. right now. You would, have, you would have wanted to see a little bit more offense. But on the other side of the coin, you can also say that his line didn't get, it's not as if Dallas's top six was creating a lot, right? Yep. The the five on five line for Dallas that was generating a lot was uh, the Johnston Ben line, which is technically their third line. So the top six for both teams at evens was basically a wash. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like, I feel like a lot of the conversations we're going to have about Pedersen today are going to be about the power play. And this is going to be a long segment, like this power play segment that you and I have kind of workshop here. This is going to be a long setup, long segment. We're going to be talking about the power play for like the next 20 minutes. So the one thing, the last thing I want to say about the game personally was I thought the Canucks were kind of suffocating Dallas on the four check. Really maybe suffocating is a bit of a strong word, but they were getting in hard on the four check. And it looked like to me, at least that they were sticking to their staples, which is why I was a little bit surprised to see the line blender come out so early. Like in the first period, we saw the lines get shaken up. I, I don't again. And there was no practice today, so we didn't really get a chance to talk to Rick talking about it, but I'd be interested to kind of hear his thoughts about shaking up lines and when the right time to do it is and when the wrong time to do it is. Um, my take was just that it was a little early last night. Like it felt like the lines weren't playing in a manner that you needed to immediately shake them up. That was just my opinion. Maybe. Yeah. What, what uh, specific changes are you thinking of? Like just shaking up the lines in general. Like I didn't have a problem with how he shook them up. Just the fact that he shook them up so early. I didn't like, cause yeah. I just thought I, I didn't really think there was a line that was standing out and like, Oh, that line's not going. You got to change this up. You got to change. You got to tweak the rest of your lines to make sure that this line doesn't get any more ice time. Like I, I didn't think that about any line uh, during the first well, period, and I thought they were good on the four check. I thought they were on those staples last night, and I just I was surprised. That's all. Well, sometimes it's just because after a penalty kill or a power play, some guys haven't have been on the bench for a long while, and and especially after um, special teams for other side, 
you kind of have to blend lines a little bit. And I wonder if that was a large part of it because uh, there were a lot of power plays for uh, for both teams. Yeah, especially in the first period too. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I, I am talking a bit earlier. Like the fir- Again, I'd have to go back and watch it. I should have written down timestamps. But if I recall, it happened earlier in the game and the two penalties the Canucks took came pretty late in the first, if I recall. The penalties did come late. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know exactly what time it happened, but I just remember watching it and saying, yeah, this was a little bit premature, I think. But anyways, uh, let's get to our next segment, which is literally just called Fixing the Power Play. No wrong answers, folks. Get them into the YouTube live chat. We've got over 60 replies to the tweet on Canucks Army, and I tweeted something from my personal account as well that's got a lot of replies as well. So Harm, I will start with you. Or do you, do you, want, do you want me to start with how I think they should fix the power play? And again, Go I don't think it. there's any wrong answer. I also don't know if there's a right answer, but this is the first one that comes to mind for me is just, I've been saying it for a while. You have to get Niels Hoaglander in the bumper spot, but I still think that that doesn't get the results that you need from Elias Pettersson on the half wall. And that's another issue I think is, and I was trying to break this down with you before Grady, can I get a paper and pen by chance? Because I want to. I'll see what I can do. I want to draw this, and I'm going to put it up on the camera. And for those on the podcast, I'll explain it first before I draw. So basically, we all know how the Canucks power play goes to work. When you have Quinn Hughes at the point, you've got JT Miller on the half wall. You have to have a left shot in the bumper with that formation, and then you have to have another left shot on the other side. And that left shot is Lewis Patterson. Excuse me, I shouldn't say you have to have a left shot. I'm saying that the Canucks choose to have a left spot in that a left shot in that spot and it is Elias Pettersson. So what I've really started to notice is that when Quinn Hughes cycles the puck to JT Miller, guys kind of shy off and give Miller some space. But when he when Quinn Hughes moves the puck to Elias Pettersson, the penalty killer, one of them, the the forwards, one of them goes high to Elias Pettersson and attacks him quickly because he's getting the puck off and on his backhand or he's going to have to make a move to kind of face the boards to keep the puck away from that oncoming penalty killer. So what I've noticed is teams are starting to press pressure Elias Pettersson so he has to move the puck back to Quinn Hughes or move it down low. And when as soon as Hughes makes that pass, the other forward is going right to Quinn Hughes to take away the Hughes pass. So it's leaving Pedersen in some very, very vulnerable positions. And a lot of times he's bobbling the puck. He's falling over. Um, he's losing the puck. And that's ultimately where a lot of the Canucks power play chances and power play offensive zone time seems like it dies is when the puck goes to Elias Pedersen. This isn't a knock on Elias Pedersen. This is how teams are scouting them. This is what teams are doing to them. And one thing I found interesting last night was JT Miller said post game that Dallas's penalty kill threw its threw some different looks at them than was different in the pre scout. So I found that interesting, and I wanted to dive into that a bit more. But basically, what I'm trying to say is you've got you've got Hughes at the top, you've got Pedersen on the wall, you've got JT on the wall as well and basically as soon as the puck goes to Quinn goes from Quinn Hughes to Elias Pettersson he's getting pressured which means as a left shot on his offside he's gonna have to move he's gonna have to turn toward the boards or he's gonna have to receive the puck on his backhand he's gonna have to or he's gonna be in a completely non-competitive spot to shoot because he's not even gonna be close to facing the net if he's getting the puck and he's immediately getting met with pressure, right? So if the four checker is coming to, to, coming to Elias Pettersson, what Pettersson will often do is move it back to Hughes. This not only takes up time off the power play, but it keeps the Canucks to the outside. That's exactly what penalty killers want. What Dallas seemed to do last night and why some turnovers were coming from Elias Pettersson or looking like it was because they were then taking away the pass to back to Quinn Hughes. So you can see it here. No, you can't. But get a little closer. You you, you could potentially. I'll no, come it's okay. and oh, it works. It works. There, yeah, you, go. there you go. So you see it. Those two arrows there for those on the YouTube live show. Those two arrows there are the are the four checkers. So as soon as the puck goes from Hughes to Pedersen, he's being met with pressure from the penalty killers, and that's something that's different. I feel like lately is what we've seen. Look at those illustrations. Yeah, I know. Way. Yeah, you're you're bang on on that point. I do think it's interesting that on the last power play opportunity that they had, they went with him in the bumper. I wonder if that's something they might experiment with because ultimately, big picture, one of the main problems I see with the power play right now is they haven't found the right fourth forward all year, Yes, right? At the start of the year, it was Kuzmenko, and Kuzmenko was sort of just an accessory. He wasn't an important part of that first unit's initial success. 
you had Heronic there for a while. Uh, obviously, you had Elias Lindholm there for a while. Had um, Connor Garland there for a while. Now you've gone with Pia Suter. None of those options have inspired much confidence. Yes. And you're not going with two defensemen on the power play by shuttling Heronic up. Yeah. And so that still stands out as an issue for me because with this default set of JT on the left side, Pedersen on the right side, Quinn Hughes up top, mm-hmm. they've had some variation of that since the 2019-20 season. Yes. What they're most familiar with what and what they're missing this year is a lethal shot in the bumper yes. because Bo Horvat was that trigger man to keep penalty killers honest. And a lot of PKers started to cheat towards the middle, which meant, guess what? You're going to have space elsewhere on the ice, whether it's net front or more space for Pedersen. And this is why I drew this illustration is because guess what, folks? Those two arrows, those two arrows don't go to Elias Pedersen. One of those arrows doesn't go to Elias Pedersen. The other one doesn't go to Quinn Hughes. If they have someone in the bumper that teams are viewing as a threat, those arrows don't go out high like that. They cheat to the middle, to the bumper, as you just said. They were cheating to Bo Horvat, which made Elias Pedersen's a one-timer a serious option and a lethal threat. Like we used to see Elias Patterson take one timers on the power play. Now he's got no time. He's got no space. And Suter doesn't have that there you lethal go. shot to get it off. He can't really find those soft spots that he needs to kind of back into and then get that shot off. And what teams are doing now is they're focusing their defensive pressure over on Pedersen, on Miller, on Hughes, because they'll give Suter that shot all day long. Right? Yeah. So you can kind of see how, teams will scheme against them now if your bumper guy isn't able to pull the trigger so the question for me becomes who goes to the middle I, i've thrown out nils huglander you need a left shot you're not putting Ilya mckayev there i've thrown out nils huglander who else i'll be honest i i'm not convinced they have the internal answer right now i think if you had to give an internal answer it's nils huglander and then vasily pod colson like vasily pod colson played on abbots for its power play yeah, I don't think either one of those is magically fixing the power play. No, but I think I, I, I think Hoaglander so. is an upgrade on Suter, and you need to at least take the upgrade right now. What about Pedersen Maybe. and the bumper? How this do you guys is, feel about This that? is the other thing that I'm considering. So I'm flipping the paper. <laughs> Let's draw up a power play that has Elias Pedersen in the bumper, and who else? Like It, it, still, Maybe it Garland. still gives you the same issue, is you still need someone on that other side, and I don't think it would be a left shot. Right it on the right Garland. side. That's I think saying. it would be Garland, right? Thought about this in the shower, Harm. <laughs> How nice would it be if Jonathan LeCaramacchi were actually ready for the NHL? And they're not going to rush him, and I commend them for that. But Vibes owner Quads is saying, sorry, this guy did what in the SHL? Sorry, this guy can shoot. How quickly? This guy's release is how deceptive? Yeah, I want that guy. It's still, on my first power It's funny play because that still wouldn't be a magic bullet answer because Lakaramaki most lethal from the yes. left half. Yes, left I half know, wall, I know. JT Miller side. And you, then you're saying, okay, well, he was in the bumper in Abbotsford. He's a right shot. So that still doesn't <laughs> fix the power play. But putting him on the right side, he'd ha- he'd have he'd still he'd still be a threat. He'd still be a threat. I would argue that a real shooting threat on the right side like that is still more effective than someone like Connor Garland, who's a much better playmaker well, than he is shooter. what you could do, another option. I'm not saying this is the best option. I'm not saying this is plan B. You thinking Brock Besser? You could put Brock there. Let's go. And then net front, you could take your pick of Hoaglander, Joshua, whoever you want in that net front spot. Okay, so who... Okay. I Nikita Zadorov uh, is the name that I come up with at the net nice. front. Nice. Like... You're hilarious. Myers Zadorov. I got a lot of that on Twitter today. A lot of people really liked it. Someone's telling me I should put this on the fridge. I should frame it. This uh, power play <laughs> drawing, drawings with quads. And again, I know those on the podcast to feel left out. I really haven't used the drawing that much. I've just flashed it at the screen twice. Uh, and I think we're doing a good job explaining it. But Harm, this is the other power play formation that I've thought about is Brock Besser coming downhill. Because he, like Brock Besser is a sneaky good playmaker, right? I think he has better playmaking than people think. Uh, I also think he's good on the wall. Like he's good on the boards. He can get that puck back. And if I have to pick a net front guy, I'm taking Niels Hoaglander because I think he's really good on the wall and along the boards. And I'm putting Niels Hoaglander at the net front. Sure. Even if it's not Zadorov or Myers. Yeah, I'm I'm open to that. Sorry, I'm drawing out the power play. So basically, how it would work, and for those 
on the podcast, it's a diamond. It's basically just a diamond with Elias Pedersen in the middle. Basically, that's all you have to imagine. I think one three could, one. One three. Yeah. Yeah. One three one. Exactly. Um, yeah, I guess that's a better way of describing it than a diamond with Elias Pedersen in the middle. But you get it. You get it. It's a square now. But and, and let's point one thing out too. Like you have those spots illustrated there. The best power plays in the league have rotation. They don't have guys staying yes, in the same yes. spots. That's what one thing I feel like they haven't been able to do is because they're playing so much around the perimeter, guys aren't really able to move in and out of those spots. And it be- just becomes too predictable for so, penalty killers. Watch this. Oh. If Coach Quads has his whiteboard, you know what he's showing the group? Wait. <laughs> yeah, no, you got it. The group might laugh at me a little bit, but that's oh, okay. what Coach, Coach yeah. Quads is I showing the group. With. And for those on the podcast, I rotated the paper 90 degrees. What does that mean? That means JT Miller's at the point. Okay, it's not a perfect sketch. It doesn't work 100% if you rotate at 90 degrees. But what I'm trying to say, Harm, is another look that they could try is moving Quinn Hughes to the left half while him coming yeah. down low. Uh, uh, he's no, got the, uh, no. da, 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 the one time we saw Quinn there. It didn't work. It's so hard for a defenseman to make that a half wall work. Quinn Hughes isn't just any defenseman. Name one defenseman that works running a power play from the half. In my mind, Quinn Hughes. Dude, I'm get, saying who who is doing that right now? Nobody. Exactly. But who, who, there's no proof of concept. So it's a vibe. But they need these <laughs> kind of out of box ideas. There because you go. What the status quo no. just isn't working. I'm not saying that they should go to that. Harmon's but it's going to take change. something unconventional to get it going, perhaps. Harmon's big answer is, oh, yeah, just try harder. Come on. I didn't say that. Yeah, basically. I threw you a couple other looks <laughs> that they could go with. I was the one that came up with the idea of this is- on the right half wall and the <laughs> net front. On Hughes, Guys stealing my idea. <laughs> well, I drew it. I drew it. On Hughes, one thing we haven't seen since the start of the year is his shot was such a threat, and he was getting so many pucks, not only just on net for shots, but rebound chances. And talk, talk, it talked about how they needed guys to get a little more gritty. Actually, I'm making the executive decision right here. We're going to hear from Rick talking yeah, yeah, yeah. on why they need that power play to get a little more gritty gritty into those greasy areas sometimes the power play you know you got it you got to get those gritty things you know you need three people to the net and like too many set plays that i think sometimes we, it burns us and we're trying to get guys to understand that we got to get the puck to the net there's got to be gritty the gritty goals on power plays it can't be pretty that's really you know they they, they got a they got a couple tonight uh but yeah unfortunate with uh, dakota back into the lot cut favor off What'd you think of that, Coach Quads? I, I, yes, he is correct. And of course, he's correct. He's a coach. He's gonna yeah. win the Jack Adams Award. He doesn't need me to say, yeah, yeah. Rick talking, Rick talking. No, might know what he's talking about. I absolutely agree with that. But who's there to clean up the garbage, right? Like when they make that traffic in front of the net, who's there to clean up the well, garbage? Well, do you put Dakota Joshua on net front? There's, mm. there's an interesting one, Dakota Joshua. I like, I like Niels Hoglander because I think Niels Hoglander has the soft hands in close, and he gets pucks back. Like yeah. his retrieval game is a one. And if they listen to me, Grady full screen. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, hold did on. you really make a paper airplane? I did. Yeah, I did. Throw it at the camera. See if you can hit it. That was good. Oh, that was good. That was not good. That was a great throw. It, Anyways, I, I'm still going to use it. It was that. promising in the beginning, but crashed hard. I hope, like it. <laughs> I hope the YouTube comments just meme the shit out of this whole segment. Oh, the quads man. drawing and then they're going to like Photoshop things on when he's holding off. Yeah, it's just, like that anyways. Pedersen thing reading out the lines in the dressing room. <laughs> it's going to be a new meme. Please, um, somebody what, in the comments, I'm begging you, please do it. I, by the way, to react to what Talkit said, yeah. like you said, I get what he's saying and I agree to some extent, but I also think to create some of that chaos, like look at Dallas, uh, yes. their first power play yes. goal, right? Yeah, Rope Hands has a greasy goal. It's it's a rebound goal. But mm-hmm. look at what preceded that. Did you see their passing movement yes. in and out? How many times it went from the flank to the bumper in and out? Elias Pedersen sprawling on the ice, completely bamboozled. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Like they completely tore apart the structure of that Canucks PK before they created the chaos. Yeah. When's the last time the Canucks moved the puck with that level of speed and crispness and pulled defenders out of position? Like 2022? 
Like when they had Bo oh, well, in the first month of the season, first month of the season yeah. for sure. But but my point being is that even Anthony Beauvillier too, like when he played that, he was finishing those chances. Fair enough. Yeah. Does like, this team miss Anthony Beauvillier? <laughs> no, oh my god. No, no they don't. But no, I know. In all seriousness, like that was another look that Bo Horvat gave them was the ability to kind of move it right back, right? Because you have those guys cheating. If they're cheating too much on Bo, he could move the puck back out, and it, like that reminded me of a Canucks power play with Bo Horvat. And again. Yes, they miss Bo Horvat. Can they overcome it and still be a really good power play? Yeah, they can. They might not have the answer in house right now, but they could. They could have an upgrade on PS Suter. I refuse to believe that. Yeah. And ultimately, you need it's it's a combination of many things. Like we heard Talkett's answer, right? And Talkett's not saying, "Yeah, we need to change up the personnel." I think they have changed up the personnel. But once they change that personnel, they also have to change what they're doing as well. And they need to listen to what Talkett's saying about getting in and you know too many set plays like that's how people scout you is okay we know they're gonna do this and if you don't have that threat like a Bo Horvat for example teams are teams are scouting you and the set plays work a lot better when you have someone like Bo Horvat right because even if the teams know what's coming it's still gonna beat them look at Alex Ovechkin for years on the Washington Capitals power play it's never just been yeah if you just cheat toward Alex Ovechkin you'll stop the Capitals from scoring no Mm -hmm. there's a reason that Alex Ovechkin scores so many goals from the exact same spot on the ice for all these years. And it's because they have other options right now. John Carlson. Yeah. The Canucks don't have a ton of other options. Yeah. I would also point out in that Dallas game specifically, they did a poor job of recovering loose pucks. It was a lot of, mm. even when they did take a shot, whether it was blocked, hit the net, rimmed around on, on the other side, they, um they didn't have enough t- tenacity to win those um, battles. A couple of situations where, Miller on situations where eight, nine times out of 10, he's recovering the puck, wasn't able to cleanly corral it. And um, and it resulted in Dallas being able to get uh, some clears. Well, speaking of Miller, why don't we hear from him on assessing yeah. the uh, poor power play here? We had a couple of looks, but honestly, I just, not, not enough, not good enough. Uh, not enough momentum for the group. Uh, we're not getting any loose pucks back. Just feel like we're playing slow. And, you know, they, they, they gave us a little different look than, Probably the pre-scout suggested today, and they—I uh, just don't think we responded very well. We had a couple looks, but we need to cap. Like we just need one right there, you know, going into the third. Super interesting about the whole pre-scout thing. Them giving them. Different yeah, and looks. that's what I'm trying to figure out is if if what he's meaning because, look, Miller understands the game at an extremely high level. He likes to talk the game at an extremely high level. He doesn't like to talk the game at an extremely high level after games. After losses, he doesn't really get into the X's and O's. Um, doesn't really want to give away much about the Canucks tactics at the best of times. But I think what he wanted to say there before he said different than the pre-scout, like he kind of paused there, not to get too tinfoil hat here. But I think what he was going to say is they were pressuring a lot harder than we expected. Like I think the Dallas penalty kill was just coming at them in a way that they weren't quite prepared for. And it, look, I don't have the drawing anymore, but I think that's what they were doing that kind of took the Canucks off guard or caught the Canucks off guard rather was them just pressuring up high going to Pedersen as soon as he would get the puck and then going out to Hughes to take away that return option for Pedersen. That makes sense. But there are also so many little intricacies with the, with the power play that, I mean, I haven't pre-scouted the stars PK, so it could be a number of factors. I mean, I remember, and this is a completely different example, but at the start of last season, one of the first times they played Edmonton, I remember having a conversation with JT uh, about the Oilers PK and how their look was a little different. And he would very specifically be pointing out that um, the the structure that they had and the angles they were giving him, his because when JT is down the left half hole, he also likes to shoot himself because that way he's you have to be honest as a PK that, okay, he can shoot and pass. And he was like, they were forcing me farther to that left side as opposed to I like to come down and be closer to it, closer to being inside the dots. So it could be a number of things. Pressure, pressuring, I think that's probably one of the factors, but um, we don't definitively know what it was. It could have been a number of, of yeah. little things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was a number of little things that Dallas did really well last night. Um, for the Canucks power play specifically, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Uh, we should get into some listener feedback. Like I said, we've got 60 replies. Yeah. I'm sure uh, there's some good stuff in there. Yeah, we've got... So, well, don't speak too soon. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, we've got 60 replies to the Canucks Army account. I didn't even check how many I had left on my account. Uh, 
I tweeted out from my personal account asking basically the same question. Actually, I should say I tweeted out and then the Canucks Army account stole from me. But anyways. I told Robert to do that. Yeah, that's okay. Robert's a good dude. Uh, okay. And I like this. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna scroll through. I'm not gonna attribute answers to people because I'm not gonna read out everybody's username. But I'll tell you one from turning the tables. I know I already broke the rule. I said, but he said the big hog, Hoaglander, get him out there. I think that's the most immediate answer for me. Talk. It doesn't sound like he's close to considering it. I know he yeah. was asked about it at Morning Skate, and you could just tell that I, I don't even think he liked the question. Yeah, that much. It doesn't seem like something that's. Uh, registering as um, as one of the f- first potential solutions. That I they find look it at. interesting because it's not it's not just. And I know there's going to be people that say this is like, oh, he doesn't like Hoaglander. It's, it's not. It's that, not that. No. It's not that at all. Rick Tockett does a really good job of explaining why he's doing things or why he's not doing things. Like that's something I've really come to appreciate since he's been in Vancouver. Is he's very honest about. Basically, any question you ask him, you're going to get an answer. And when I think back to when Hoaglander wasn't even on the power play, the answer Talkit gave, I didn't love the reasoning per se, but he gave his honest answer. And the the answer he gave was, he's playing so well at 5-on-5 five five right now, and who knows if we increase his ice time, if maybe that 5-on-5 five five play slips a little bit, and we really need him at 5-on-5. Five five. So getting him on the second power play, you know, how important is that type thing? And that, that was his answer at the time. And again, I, I think I reacted to it when it when it was said. I didn't love it. But Hoagland's on power play too right now. I almost wonder if Talkit might be thinking in his head like, okay, I like Hoaglander on power play too and I like where he is on power play too. And we need to have two power plays that we can at least look to to produce some offense. Nah, I don't think that's... What do you think the reason is? If I had to hypothesize, I'm not trying to put words into Talkit's mouth. Mm-hmm. If I had to look at it strictly like just me looking at Hoaglander and a potential fit in the bumper. The two concerns I would have are number one, look back at the tape on the goals that he scored in the NHL. He's not beating goalies very often with a snipe of a shot from the high slot. A lot of it is chances right around the blue paint, whether it's tips, deflections, Mm -hmm. rebounds, little backhands, uh, it's it's not necessarily sniping goalies and finding the corners or um, the difficult spots like the bend shot, which was yes. just above the pads, far side. That's a really tough location yeah. for a goalie uh, to track the puck. Hoaglander's not hitting those spots when he's scoring in the NHL. Yeah. So that's that's number one. I don't know if he has the shot from that spot. The second aspect is Hoaglander does so many things well, right? He's got the unbelievable motor He's tenacious. He wins inside body position. He's got quick hands. But one trait that, one weakness that he perhaps has is that he doesn't have the highest offensive IQ. Yes. That was like the- reads and like, and and that's a consistent thing that when you talk to other other teams as well, the other, other people, not just uh, pe- people around the Canucks, yeah. like that's an observation they have too. And in the bumper spot, you need to be really smart about understanding yes. when do I like wh- you got to understand angles. You got to understand geometry really well um, and understand how how do I what situation do I sag off and go to the high spot? Yes. What situations do I creep down a little bit? Um, because it's the middle of the ice. PKs want to protect that. So you have to be really smart about positioning yourself and actually getting open. And it requires a lot of very quick reads and um and that's a lot to put uh on a player who I don't even know if Hoaglander's played the bumper in his career before. Yeah, that's a great point and I mean when we talk to other players that have played the bumper and like this is a conversation I can't remember who I was talking to. It might have been Bo a couple of years ago, but actually I think it was Bo. I, anyways, it doesn't matter. It was a player telling me about what it's like to play in the bumper spot. And basically what he said is the only way to get good at it is by getting reps in there and you need a lot of reps to learn when to sag off, when to make those those subtle movements, right? And you know, like Brock Bester, somebody that we've seen kind of evolve in that role, but we know that he, they need to have, you know, they need to have a left shot for it to be effective for Miller, right? And uh, again, Brock's probably not the answer in the bumper spot, but like there's a guy who does have that offensive IQ, does have that knowledge of shapes and can, you know, decide when it's good to sag off when it's good to move in closer i i don't know what the answer is let me let me throw this one at you guys so last year and the years before they had jason king running the power play 
Now, Quads, you reported last year, just off some simple Googling here, that they they weren't going to hire a replacement for him. They decided they're going to go internally. They're going to have Rick Tockett. We know the Sedins run power play too. Mm -hmm. They are 28th in the league right now since the All-Star game at the power play. They've dropped to 17th overall. Last year, I think they were 11th at 22%. Do you think not having a true power play coach and I'm listen I don't want anyone to think that I'm knocking the experience of Rick Tockett the Sedins they have Sergey Gonchar here but having someone who knows specifically you know how to get the best out of these players and again not saying that the current coaches don't but some teams just have assistant coaches purely to work on the power play most they do, do. Yeah, yeah they do and that that was something I thought about but I was trying to put myself in Rick Tockett's shoes and I'm not again I'm not trying to do a bit here but, like, if I won multiple Stanley Cups as a yeah. power play coach, which Rick Tockett has, I might say, yeah, you know what? I can do this on my own. Mm. And, I, and again, it's it's not like Rick Tockett's just operating on, a, on his own and saying it's going to be done my way and nobody else's way. There's input from all sides, right? Like, Rick Tockett has conversations with his players. Rick Tockett has conversations with his assistant coaches. Like, Rick Tockett can't talk m enough about how much he relies on and appreciates the input of his assistant coaches. So again, I, I don't, I don't want to go down that train of thought to be honest with you, Grady, because I just think that he, he has the experience as a power play coach. And mm -hmm. like, like let's say Rick Tockett wasn't the power play coach for the Canucks and there was a different head coach. If we had to pick, okay, who would you want to come in as the Canucks power play coach? Rick Tockett would probably be pretty high on the list. Yeah. So I don't have an issue with it. And the Sedins would be pretty high on the list. The one thing I think about with the Sedins and Power Play 2 is like the Sedins are sitting in the press box. They can't make on the fly changes to Power right. Play 2. And you, like, it's hard to say, yeah, they're running Power Play 2. Yes, they're working with them a lot at practice, but the Sedins aren't on the bench. Yeah, also look at the, compare the star second unit to the Canuck second unit. Mm -hmm. Star second unit has Matt Duchesne, Wyatt Johnston, Thomas Harley, I believe. Mm -hmm. They've got who else? They They're got? so deep. It's like it's so Isn't it stacked. Stan Coven now? It might be Stan Coven now. It, they've got an embarrassment of uh, of riches. Sagan. How did I forget about Sagan? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And Stan Coven. Like that's for a lot of NHL teams. That could be a first unit power play. Yes. If Jake Ottinger keeps up the play that he has, and I know they played some weaker teams, but last night he was pretty solid. Like I think that's a pretty good. I don't want to say sneaky, but you know, second tier Stanley Cup contender. Oh, I think they're first tier. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I do think they're first tier, yeah, as, probably, especially if Ottinger probably. turns around. I think that's maybe the thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, he's, he's the X factor. I think they're me. second tier right now, but I would put them first tier if Ottinger turns things around. Yeah. Also depends on how how many teams you want to include in the quote unquote. First sure. Team. Yeah. And I'm still not buying Ottinger, just so everybody knows. Wow. Still not buying the turnaround. This epic turnaround. He beat the Coyotes twice. No, that's fair. But hey, remember the playoffs a couple of years ago against Calgary. He was unreal. And yeah. I know it was the Calgary Flames, but I mean, he was good last year, too. Yeah. All of us. Also, year. don't forget that sometimes you have a guy like Bobrovsky, right? Yeah. Last season wasn't good at all in the regular yeah. season Alex and then Lyon. turned it on yeah. in the playoffs. Yeah, that's a good point. Goalies are volatile, man. We've talked about that yeah. many times. OK, anything else on the power play before we get to anyone else? Close out this sunny Friday afternoon. No, let's get to anyone else. Do you have anything on the power play? Uh, I don't have anything okay. on the power play. And I know I said I'd read responses. I think I'm just going to put these all in an article. I think that's going to be something that's on CanucksArmy.com tomorrow uh, is everybody's kind of takes on this. And I like some people busted out the notes app and wrote like oh. essays. Like, look at this. Someone saw our tweet and responded with an essay in the notes app. You know what would be really funny is to compile every single one, whether it's good or not. Yeah, and then can you imagine the Canucks coaching staff just yeah, going take through it, it to talk it? Yeah, what do you put think it of this? A, put it in a bar graph. <laughs> well, you, they, they'd have laughs at some of the suggestions. I wonder if on a couple of them they'd be like, "Yeah, I agree on that one." But yeah. also, I, I think it'd be really entertaining. I like this. This one that I showed you, the notes app. This dude left his like he's showing us that he had the receipts. Like he wrote this and he included it in the tweet, February twenty second. 2024 he wrote this and he's like i stand by this and wow. i love that's a certain level of confidence that i think a lot more of us need to have in life so shout out to chris at wc jays fan well when you're whipping out the notes app and you can't fit your thoughts in a totally. 280 character yep. tweet like and and yeah. that's what i love about this market like it's a smart market there's people dialed in and you get former coaches weighing in former players and 
hey, when when the team's struggling, like I said earlier, like you got to welcome all ideas, even right. if some of them are crazy. Yeah, I, I might have put these in a bar graph. Anyways, <clears throat> that'll be on Canucks Army, hopefully. How would you put them weekend? in a bar graph? Yeah, uh, everybody who says put Hoaglander on will go to one, right? Okay. <laughs> and then everybody who says Heronic. I don't think every um, I don't think the ideas are going to be that uniform. Like, uniform. It'd be a big bar graph. I can do big bar graphs. Big bar graph. Big. Guy. Uh, what's this one? X axis. Dude, some of them are going to be like a paragraph <laughs> explanation. Math class. How are you going to fit that in your graph? What do you mean? Like the rationale. Like somebody's answer is going to be like many sentences long of how they'd fix a power play. How are you going to fit that on? Well, I'll abbreviate it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this. I love this, that uh, math guy harm is, is challenging. I don't know. My vibes are telling me that this is pretty good. I like Besser, the idea of, the, like, of here, an article I'll, like this. I'll though. scroll through. Um, Grady, another piece of paper, please. All right. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but like, here, here's, here's, here's an example. We've got, okay. So keeping track here, Hoaglander. Okay. You might be onto something. <laughs> Might be a little tough, but I'll figure it out. It might not be exactly how I framed it, but I'll get the best ideas or the top, the, the most talked about ones. And the most talked about one is Hoaglander in the bumper spot. But again, uh, some interesting thoughts from you on that. And again, I, I thought thinking about it, just the conversation that we've had with guys who have played the game at a high level is to do it, to play the bumper spot. You need to get that experience and you need to do it. And hey, maybe that's an argument for the Canucks putting Hoaglander there down the final stretch of the season because they need to figure out their power play by the playoffs. Maybe that's the argument. Maybe. I'm experimenting time is running. Uh, it's there's not a lot of time left. Yeah. Like these are things they have to sort out ASAP and they're facing the Ducks next game. Like they could easily rip off two, three power play gold. Maybe not three, but. You know, you look back at that Colorado game, Colorado's power play turned it on. Mm -hmm. Canucks couldn't. Same thing last night, right? Special teams in a playoff series, it'll single handedly win some games and it, it can single handedly win a series. Yeah, you've got so, so few power play opportunities in the playoffs that, again, it bodes well that the Canucks are still playing really well at five on five. Yes. Like that's the silver lining from last night. But that goes yeah. to the point where it's like, okay, if they can get that one power play goal, like the margins are so thin. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. It's, that can yeah. make or break a game. You don't want to be Vegas in the past is a good example of a team that was so good at five on five. But up until last season, the power play in the postseason was such a letdown. Yeah. And you want to remember in the COVID year when Montreal made the Stanley Cup final, they beat Vegas in large part because of special teams. Yes. Yes. That's it. Actually, even though Vegas points. was a way better team on paper yep. than Montreal. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's get to, Oh no, before anyone else, I need to tell you that that segment that we just did was brought to you by the Wendy's daily face off survivor pool game. The only thing sweeter than the taste of victory is starting your day with the new Cinnabon pull apart from Wendy's, but there's no reason you can't have both because Wendy's and daily face off survivor are giving you a chance to win weekly prizes all season long. And hey, even if you make a few wrong picks, at least you know heading to Wendy's right now for a $5 Cinnabon pull apart and small coffee is a great choice. Sign up for Daily Face Off Survivor Pool Fantasy today, sponsored by Wendy's and the Wendy's app. Harm, been a while for you since anyone else. You want to do an anyone else read? I don't have it in That's front okay. of me. It's okay. I shouldn't throw you on the spot like that. People say sometimes that they miss you doing anyone else reads. But I'll take it because it's time for anyone else presented by DoorDash. It's our listener's chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listener's chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's all capital letters, NATION, and the numbers 25. Offer valid in Canada, subject to change, terms do apply. All right, we had a squirrel one. There was actually some really fun squirrel facts in the chat. Squirrel! It's one from Nar, who, who usually brings the squirrel chat. He says, boys, I just learned that squirrels cannot vomit or burp. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> they just I chew. Can, I can picture a squirrel vomiting, though. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's because my dog's light brown. <laughs> but I can picture it. Like, can, can you not picture a squirrel vomiting? Like, sure. what I'm trying to say is I swear After I've seen articles. that before. I swear I've seen that before. Do you know what I mean? Like, maybe I've dreamt of squirrels barfing. I, oddly specific, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> that just made me think of it. It made me think of it. Um, oh, here's a good one. 
This is also from NAR. Imagine the twins came out of retirement as power play specialists. Would they be any worse than the current power play? Do, do you want me to be fun or be honest? Both. <laughs> the fun answer would be to say, yeah, it'd be amazing. It'd be fun. The honest answer is... Power play two? <laughs> yeah, yeah, power play two. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Carmen, Carmen Gruel. How do you... Yeah, okay. Anyways, uh, what about PD Hogs Besser and then Miller, Garland, Joshua for the top two lines? What'd you think of Hoaglander and Besser on PD's wings? I didn't think that line, they had a great shift in the third period and uh, and Pedersen on a partial change had a good chance in the first period. But outside of that, I didn't notice them a ton. I'd like to see Brock back with JT, if I'm being honest. Hmm. Yeah. Get JT. I'm sorry, like, but get JT away from Lafferty and Baines. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's absolutely uh, correct, Grady. Yeah, you I, can't I, expect like look, JT's been a monster, but you can't expect him to drive a line with an AHL call up yeah. and a fourth line player that has like six, seven points in his last four. I guess he was trying to yeah. insulate him with the young kid. But here's the thing: I don't get like they practice with all those lines and then come warm ups. Like you're, you see all these. Well, not all because they reunited Bluger, Garland, and. And Joshua, but all of a sudden they throw like these couple random lines out together. It just it seems like to me it was kind of just a rash decision. And you hope maybe they got a little more practice time. But then again, what the hell do I know? I don't think it's rash. They probably thought about it a lot. Probably yeah. had conversations mm. with people in the leadership group like JT. Yeah, that's and fair. Just change their mind and. But still, put JT with players who can think the game at a level that he can. Right. This one from Mike Lavely, and I like this. Top teams don't juggle lines. Colorado, Dallas, Edmonton, Carolina, and New York don't juggle their lines. They try things in practice and then give them a full game to build chemistry. Yeah, I mean, teams do juggle lines, and some of those teams do juggle lines. Like Edmonton's juggled lines all year. Yeah. But I mean, the top line has been semi consistent sure. with Nugent Hopkins and Hyman, but their middle six has been a blender the entire season. And also, Look at how Nugent Hopkins and Hyman have performed this year. There's been no yeah. downstretch for those guys, right? Yeah, like, so that's no... a reason they've stuck with McDavid. But I mean, Dry Settle has had countless number of of wingers. Um, the third line has had endless number of combinations. Even lately, Adam Henrique, since being acquired, has bounced up and down the the second and third lines. Yeah. And this is for a team that, since the coaching change, I don't know exactly where they. Um, where they rank in terms of record, but they're they've been extremely hot since uh, Knobloch's hiring. Yeah, exactly. And look, we you know we we brought up Nugent Hopkins Hyman. Thank God for Zach Hyman's dad and the Oilers. <laughs> Oilers success oh. this year. <laughs> Speaking of the Oilers, are you guys getting a little worried that uh, that lead the Canucks have is evaporating and that they could overtake them for first in the Pacific? No, a, a little bit. Really, two games in hand, right? And with one game remaining between them, six points back, two games in hand, and they have a head-to-head meeting. Like, yes, it's going to be the Cucks fun. are still in the driver's yeah. seat. They control their destiny here quite clearly. But are you getting a little nervous? Well, yeah, how- it, 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 they're within striking distance. Yeah, all of a sudden that game on Sunday versus the Ducks becomes I won't I don't want to say must win, but. Man, they better bang. Better those. win, <laughs> which leads me to this question from RP eighty eight. Mm-hmm. Do you think Shilov's We'll get his shot if we lose the next one. Well, okay, so maybe well, it doesn't lead in. But okay, let, let's. Who say, do you start on Sunday? Yeah, exactly. That's a good question. I still think it's Seelovs. I don't know, but actually, you know what? The loss to Dallas really does complicate. Yeah, right? That's what I'm saying. Because because give, give me game. Like, I'm just going to say to Smith. I'm just going to say. Do you want to start your better goalie against the team you should beat, and then on Tuesday against Vegas? No. Do you want to throw Shilovs to the Wolves? No. no. No, I also the thing is we're so close to the playoffs, and the Canucks mm-hmm. have had some close losses against some of these top teams in the West now, like Colorado, like LA, like Dallas. A team psychology, you don't want it creeping in the back of their mind yeah. that you mm-hmm. throw out a guy like Silovs, and let's say he has a rough night and you lose again. You don't want it in the team's back of their mind at all that hey, we we've been struggling lately. Yeah. Against some of these legit cup contenders, you want to give your give your, your team, team the, the best, best shot, shot to yeah. win okay yeah exactly yeah. uh so yeah it'll be interesting to see who they start on sunday uh reiterating this we won't be in on monday we're here on good friday which i just found out today is a stat holiday i thought i thought the stat was monday but anyways yeah i thought that too anyways I googled it no 
Like, shouldn't the aren't they Hall both stats? In? No, Monday isn't a stat. Oh, okay. Not in BC at least. See, that's just quads making if us we're work looking on a stat. At the, wow. If we're looking at the core of the holiday, isn't the celebration? Well, I guess the celebration is Jesus dying, but like it, rising no. on the third day is yeah. the whole point. Yeah. It, yeah, it's considered a public holiday in Alberta, New Brunswick, New Google repeated New Brunswick, uh, Northwest Territories, none of it, Quebec, and uh, the Yukon. For government employees, I believe. That's an interesting holiday because there's no, that's the thing. It, it, why is Friday the stat? Because if Jesus doesn't rise on the third day, there's no holiday. I'm out of my depths in this conversation. Yeah, well, <laughs> diving into it a little bit, putting Ask all that chat. Sunday school it, to work. Yeah. All right. People um, in the chat, are you working today? Yeah, I, I I always thought it was Monday. I always thought it was a Monday too. And it makes sense. Like that, I like, remember the four day weekends in school. Oh, those are the best. Oh, yeah. I miss those. Yeah. I tried to run by it by Sakaris. He's like, this isn't school anymore, Grady. Come on. Did you use school as an example? <laughs> I cannot imagine that. Going I said it well. jokingly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna message Quads and be like, you took hey, it way too serious. We got half day Wednesdays. <laughs> can we? And like, can I call when it? When the a, hell is nap time? <laughs> when's the next pro D day, Quads? <laughs> hey, speaking um, of, I saw that you might be giving the stanch in WrestleMania off. That's a. I am giving a nice gesture off. by you. Well, boss, I man. knew it was. I knew it was WrestleMania because my no no and people always ask for updates on no no. He's hosting a WrestleMania party. So I'm going. He's Let's hosting go. a WrestleMania party. And there's not a chance in hell I would miss that. But we're only doing night one. We're not doing night two. The Canucks don't play on night two, but we have other engagements on night two. So we can't attend. Uh, but he wanted to do night one, Saturday night, WrestleMania. So that's how I found out that I had to give Wyatt the day off. So I texted him and just like, hey, do you need WrestleMania off? And uh, I think he's going to take that option. Yeah. They, Man of the people. He's going to be happy. Yeah. Okay, uh, we will close it out there for my co-host, Harmon Dial, and our technical producer, Grady Saffs. My name is Dave Grigelli. Thanks so much, folks, for tuning in to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric. The best part, by choosing electric, you can get up to $11,000 in rebates and incentives the BZ4X are in stock and selling quickly, so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local Pacific Toyota dealer to get your hands on one. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.